boy howdy, how long has it been since I have talked about trains on a list. I, I, I kind of stopped doing the list of trains because I was slowly but surely expending ideas. I, I was doing them every week. I, I still do them every week, but, uh, you know, yeah, I, I just wanted to take a break from, from stuff because, I, I, you know, I, I, I talk about all kinds of vehicles. It just so happens that a big component of my following happens to be rail fans, which is understandable, and I have no issue with that, of course. And I decided this week, since i had been doing a lot of World War II aircraft the last couple weeks, why not go back to trains for a time? You know, just just for funsies, why not? I, I, I had some other ideas, and I thought, why not do some more mad science experiments, more crazy stuff, more just insane nonsense that trains have been, well, at the center of. These are five trains that were clearly just mad science experiments, Part 7! Logging locomotives. Now, I concede I think I'm cheating with these. I I I'm fairly confident in the element that these aren't trains, or even proper locomotives in a sense, because you've probably already noticed they do not, at all, run on rails uh, whatsoever. Therefore, that would technically make them odd, very strange traction engines. Still steam-powered, yes, but not locomotives. But they're so perplexing, and I can't fathom putting them anywhere else, that I decided to just put them on this list because I think they're worth talking about because... Well, for one thing, they just look like regular steam locomotives with treads. That's what they look like. Don't tell me they look like anything else. I mean, look at them. They look exactly like a steam locomotive that was stuck on treads. And they worked in their own way, to the point that the design was repeated multiple times. There is more than one example of this particular type of locomotive. This is the Lombard Steam Log Hauler, which had a spur gear drive to one of the track wheels that came from a crankshaft, plus a chain, which transferred the drive from one track to the other. That, that it sounds like a really slapped together way of doing that, but it, it did work. And there are preserved examples of this particular design, believe it or not. And used either wheels in the front or skis, largely depending on the presence of snow. If there was snow, they used skis, obviously. And if there wasn't, then they used the wheels. But in any event, they were really good for logging operations, since there were places where it wasn't really possible to lay rails, even rough ones for geared locomotives like Shays. So it would use these logging loco tractor engines, I don't even know what you'd call them. These, these things, these things, to move the lumber in places where there weren't rails, generally taking them to either a road to be loaded onto a truck or likely back in the day where the rails actually were and a regular train would take them where they needed to go. They were very helpful little things and there are multiple examples in preservation, at least three of which in running condition. So that's a pretty good showing for these perplexing beasts. The Hythe Pier Railway. This is a whole railway that, um, well, it's, it's in the UK, and it's part of the Hythe Pier that involves the Hythe Ferry that provides a link between the English port city of Southampton and the Hampshire village of Hythe, which is on the west side of Southampton Water. Now, what's weird about it is that, well, it involves a railway on a pier, and it's a tiny little baby thing. And it dates back to 1878, when an act of parliament made provision for the construction of a tramway along the pier. But the narrow gauge line wouldn't be laid until 1909, on the northern side of the pier. It was meant to replace the trucks they had been using that had been damaging the pier decking. The initial vehicles were actually propelled by hand. And it stayed that way until 1922, when it was electrified. And it would use electric locomotives from then on. They still use it, even now. Seriously, it's still there, just trucking along, helping move things along the pier. It's a nice little setup, if not a bit odd. Rotary Snowplows. Now, this one bothers me because I was resisting so hard putting this on a math science list, because to me, 
They aren't crazy at all, but I think it's because I'm super used to these. See, as some of you are already well aware, I have a bit of a history involving railway heritage. My father and grandfather had model railways, and my dad took me to every railway museum and heritage railway he could possibly find when I was a kid. My point is that I have seen these multiple times, yet every time they've come up in a previous video, I get at least one, if not more than one, comment talking about how someone has never seen these before and think they look a little nuts. And I guess, outside of my personal experience with them, maybe they do look a little crazy. But their purpose is right in their name. These are snowplows, railway snowplows, used to remove snow from the lines. The rotary was invented in Toronto, Canada by a dentist. Why is it always dentists? I don't understand. J.W. Elliot in 1869, though he would never build a working model or prototype. The design would be expanded upon though, and working models would be tested with sand later. During the winter of 1883 and 84, Orange Jewel, the person who'd followed up on the research, contracted with the Leslie Brothers of Toronto to build a full-size prototype that, turned out, worked. Rotary snowplows don't work that different from snowblowers that you might use in your driveway. They spin, take in the snow, generally very large swaths of snow, and blow it away. They're meant to run in front of a traditional locomotive, and they aren't perfect as they do have pretty high maintenance costs. These days, most railroads don't even bother using them anymore, preferring to use fixed-bladed plows in conjunction with bulldozers in case of very, very heavy snowfall. Early rotaries would have used steam power, but there are other examples that use diesel or even electric. Some take their power from a locomotive, some don't. They vary greatly in terms of their exact specifications, but they all effectively do the same thing. They spin and get rid of snow. That's... That's what they do, and they did it well for many years. They were insanely helpful. The nuclear locomotive. <laughs> this isn't actually what you think it is. I'm only calling it the nuclear locomotive because of where it worked and why it looks the way it does, because you're probably looking at this and being like, what the, what is that? And why is that? What is, anything about this, please tell me that's not a nuclear reactor mounted on a locomotive, and I have good news, it is not at all. No, seriously, this is a conventional diesel electric locomotive. Well, obviously not conventional, but in terms of power supply, it's just a diesel. So what's the deal? Why does it look weird? Well, it was built in June of 1954, back when America was busy experimenting with all things nuclear powered. And she was designed to run at the Idaho National Laboratory, or INL, on their short line that they were using to help build and mess with nuclear reactors at the time. This locomotive is about 45 feet long, yet weighs 215 tons, about the weight of an EMD SD70. Why is it so heavy? Well, because this locomotive was meant to move and transport nuclear materials, like a lot of them, it was natural that they actually protect the locomotive itself from radiation. As such, that large circular enclosure that you see on the top there contains very thick radiation shielding made mostly of lead and partially filled with water. There's also leaded glass viewports on either end. All this is meant to protect the operator of said locomotive, as well as partially the locomotive herself. She was used heavily to move nuclear test rigs all over the place wherever they needed to go, and she still exists. Though her original home's rail infrastructure was largely disassembled in the 1980s, she was spared, and in 2006 was sent to Arco, Idaho, for display at the EBR1 Museum. Because fortunately, she herself, not really radioactive. She's, she's all right. So you can go there and see her if you want. The Heard M. Simpson locomotive. Okay, so I admit again that I am cheating with this because technically speaking, as far as I understand it, this engine was not actually built. Therefore, I should put her on something like Weird Train Concepts, but she's so weird and so nuts that I thought, 
Ah, the heck with it. Y'all want to hear about this anyway. This is arguably one of the most impractical locomotives I've ever seen, and it was put forward by Frederick Hurd and Edward Simpson of Wakefield, England. She was intended for use underground in mines. Now, if she's a steam engine, how was that supposed to work? One of the problems with, of course, using steam engines in a mine is that it's underground and the smoke fills up and then everyone asphyxiates. It's good times. But this design offered a solution. The basic concept was that the smoke from the boiler was taken and instead of being expelled, recycled and sent through the fire a second time. Our illustrious inventors of this locomotive seem to think that continuously recycling the exhaust gases would eventually make it so they could just release them into a confined space like a mine without any kind of issue. Common sense dictates that that's, that's probably not how that would work at all. The fire of the engine was stoked automatically by the rotary feed barrel under the coal hopper. Which is great, but that meant the fire could only be fed when the engine was moving. And it would be fed whether or not it needed to be. Which raises all sorts of problems, like, like how are you going to start her in the first place? And what if the stoker overfeeds her? Like, there's some basic functionality issues we got going on with that. Also, you may not be able to tell, but this was actually a cab forward design. And the driver would have no access to the, the fire. At all. And the design doesn't seem to have a chimney, because that's not what that is. That's the coal bunker. On top of the locomotive where the funnel goes, generally. There doesn't actually seem to be any place where the gases would eventually be expelled, because, look, you can't just throw them back onto the fire constantly. That, 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 that is literally impossible. I mean, you can do it, but you're, you're not going to have a working machine if you do. Also, wouldn't the coal hopper being that high make this locomotive very, very top-heavy? Wouldn't that be a thing? I mean, I guess it would work in mines, and I can never see it going very fast in that particular setting, but but still, it's just a just a really weird decision. Especially when, again, mines, like how tall are mines generally? Not not very. It is, in pretty much every conceivable way, just a really bad idea. So we should probably be thankful it was never built. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owen, Spencer Kitson, 131-232, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Row of Videos, Lord Off 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, Raw Hunter2860, Iserfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGrow, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, The Arizona Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Dr. Razor 78, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, Amtrak 2024 Productions, and Tommy Rossini. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.